Hello everybody, Peptide Buddy here for our first episode ever. Uh, so what I'm pretty much doing is making some five minute videos that are cut to the chase and evidence based, diving into different peptides, because I know there's a lot of videos out there, but not too much touching on the research in, you know, a field that's definitely growing. So, Samoralin, here we go. And like all peptides, Samoralin's growing in popularity. I know Andrew Huberman said he was on in a recent podcast. Uh, it's also called GHRH I29, um, it's a GHRH analog, growth hormone, releasing hormone, 29 amino acids long, which is surprisingly pitty short, and can stimulate the pituitary to secrete growth hormone through interaction with the growth hormone releasing hormone receptor itself, which is pretty unique in that it could work directly with the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, and, you know, it's used clinically for growth hormone deficiency, but you know what people are going for when they take this is the HGH or growth hormone uh, type effects. So downstream secretion of HGH, IGF-1, things like promotion of growth and recovery, all sounds pretty good. So I already mentioned that it's used to treat growth hormone deficiency clinically, um, just it's kind of interesting that it works with the receptor of the growth hormone releasing hormone itself because, you know, this ghrelin GHSR pathway, which is present in other peptides, is like what's known to stimulate the voracious hunger. And people just want to eat, eat, and eat when they're on peptides. And, uh, you know, the fact that this compound doesn't utilize the same pathway, it's pretty interesting to me. But of the utmost importance, does Samoralin show promise? And, you know, of course, it's up for you to decide, and there will definitely be more research done on the topic in the future. There were some interesting conclusions drawn this far in, you know, what's a pretty new field of research. So it exhibits that it doesn't only raise growth hormone and IGF-1, which it does, and consistently done in different studies, but it also may interestingly increase prolactin, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, LH and FSH, which stimulate production of testosterone. Could there be implications in this easy subcutaneous injection in possibly treating hypogonadism and raising testosterone levels? You know, it's super fascinating, and I'm curious to see what future research will hold. And on top of that, it shows that the effects of the rise in growth hormone in IGF-1 could be longer lasting. It's possible that the effects of somorolin will last, you know, much, much longer than the half-life of the drug itself. The role in fat loss and body composition, although anecdotally reported, seems a bit to be determined. Some studies show that there are no changes, while others show that there's increased lean body mass in patients taking it. And of note, pretty low side effect profile. And as far as final notes go, I'd say it's a safer compound, but sourcing can be tough. Uh, like with everything else, especially in this realm, consult your doctor and make sure you get a reliable source because you know, there are plenty of underground labs out there that are selling something that says some more on the, on the label. But besides that, who really knows what you're getting? Um, we know it increases growth hormone and IGF-1. And, you know, there might be these really interesting findings in the future to answer the questions if, could we stimulate testosterone with some oral in? Or could it action on the body be much longer lasting than we might have initially thought and so I'm going to be doing more videos like this this is the first one um, but we're just trying to keep them concise about five minutes long and just just enough detail to kind of start your own research journey really and thank you very much